Mac OS on an iPad. This idea has been popping up on our Vergecast hotline in videos, comments, everywhere. People really want to run the Mac operating system on the iPad because iPads just can't do everything that your MacBook can. And as the iPad keeps getting more hardware upgrades, the software really isn't keeping up. Leading up to this past WWDC, people were hoping iPadOS was going to get some updates that might even make it a little more like macOS finally. Instead, we got a calculator app. That's right, we're bringing Calculator to iPad. Yay! I guess it isn't too surprising considering Apple's past response when this type of question was brought up. No. All of these questions are pretty much asking the same thing. Why won't Apple put macOS on the iPad? And to answer as best we could, I tried to make my iPad run macOS to see what the experience was like. I talked to somebody with a lot of experience developing apps for iPad, and I also talked to The Verge's editor-in-chief, Neelai Patel, to help answer, why not? And here's a hint, money. But maybe not in the way you might think. The iPad is marketed for creative professionals, and I'm a pro, I do video work, but I wouldn't think to do any of that work on an iPad over my desktop or laptop, especially because every time I see somebody online saying stuff like, I did all my editing or whatever work on an iPad for a month, it's sort of presented like they are attempting a dangerous stunt or some impossible task. I hear a lot that it's good enough for small projects or social videos or it works in a pinch, but to me that just screams compromise and limitations. I used this iPad for a few weeks and ran into a huge amount of headaches and a laundry list of things I couldn't do on the iPad versus my Mac. I could go off, but here's a list, so I don't. But I also recognize the crazy amount of hardware they shoved into this. This is their highest end 13 inch iPad Pro. And just look at the specs on this guy. I mean, they skipped an M3 iPad and went straight to the M4. Even their Crush commercial seems to hint at all the power they're cramming into this iPad and all the tools it might be able to replace, but it just feels like they didn't include the software to match. The hardware being so beefy makes the software stand out like this strange bottleneck. You've got all this power that iPadOS won't let you make the most of. Well, now I want to see what all the buzz is about. What would macOS be like on this iPad? My plan was to run macOS on an iPad as a virtual machine. This wouldn't be installing macOS directly on the iPad. We'd instead be setting some of the iPad's resources aside to act as its own machine and then boot macOS into that. I was going to use the app UTM, but Apple removed hypervisor support in an update to iOS 16.4 and on. Hypervisor is what made virtualization possible, and I'm on iPadOS 17. So since we can't run a virtual machine on the iPad, I figured our next best bet would be to just screen mirror off a MacBook, put it on the iPad, and that way we can navigate Mac OS and full versions of apps with the Apple Pencil and see what that's like. And hey, to be fair, the experience might suck because Mac OS is not optimized for touch like the iPad is. It's really easy to mirror your screens with Sidecar, and I'm opting for a wired connection because I don't want to have to worry about latency. Make sure both devices are on the same Wi-Fi, check that AirPlay is enabled for both, go to screen mirroring and add another display, which will be your iPad. So I'm not trying to extend my display, I'm going to mirror it. And just like that, Mac OS is kind of on your iPad. Now let's pretend this MacBook doesn't exist for a little bit, and I give you iPad Mac. I know Mac OS isn't optimized for touch, and when you see it on the iPad screen, it really shows. These Mac apps look like they'd be a challenge to navigate with clunky finger touches, even if Sidecar would let me, which it won't. I can use the pencil and some touch gestures like zooming and rotation though, so it does know my fingers are there, but even using the pencil can be a bit less precise than I need it to be when resizing windows. Some buttons and panels just have very tiny hitboxes to click. You can only use the mouse or trackpad of whatever device you're mirroring from, which makes sense. You can't use the trackpad of your iPad's magic keyboard, but you can use the key part of the keyboard, so kind of an arbitrary limitation. Universal control wasn't meant to work this way. 
but honestly, this feels pretty good to me despite not being able to use all the iPad's inputs the way I would like to. I really liked using the Apple Pencil Pro in Mac OS, and it was nice drawing with it in Adobe Animate and Photoshop with the full UI. And even though this iPad is insanely light and thin, it's a little back heavy, so I have to hold it steady when drawing with any sort of pressure, or it'll kind of rock back and forth. And that way I can't keep a hand free for keyboard shortcuts. I actually decided that I would edit this portion of the video in full Premiere Pro on the iPad Pro connected through Sidecar. So let's ask editor Owen how it's going. What do you think, me? Thanks, me. Editing feels all right. I mean, it's just normal Premiere Pro, but with an Apple Pencil. But even this feels like a faster workflow than I've experienced on some iPad NLEs. And sure, the 13-inch screen has a more cramped workspace, but I appreciate being able to use Lumetri and my plugins and having more control over my workspace. I'm trying to just use the Pencil Pro and keyboard, but I keep finding myself wanting to reach for the mouse for more precision with things like adjusting clip lengths and audio transitions. But if I just used a separate mouse and keyboard, then I'd be just editing on a tiny screen and kind of missing the point of using the iPad part of this. I mean, heck, this isn't even using the M4 chip. This is kind of just turning the iPad into a Wacom tablet. So it feels okay. The pencil's way more precise than I thought it would be. My fingers would be less so but I'm not quite sold on video editing being something that benefits from being a touch-first experience. It's nice to have the option though for things like masking, rotoscoping, or using the pen tool. I liked having some touch and pencil support when using full versions of apps, and of course, managing big project files without pulling my hair out. And I feel a little weird saying that I think I like it better than what the iPad's version of this experience is. So this specific setup is not a solution, but it does feel like there's a little something there. Anyway, enough of this, back to me. Mirroring a screen is not at all the same as actually running macOS on an iPad, and I just don't know how complicated that might be. For that, I figured I should talk to somebody who speaks Apple's language, specifically Swift, Apple's programming language. I pretty much use my iPad for everything I can, except for literally programming. And that is like how I've divided it. This is Riley Testit. He's a developer of Altstore.io, which is a sideloading app, and the Delta emulator, which just came to the App Store. If you ever played any sort of Nintendo game on your iPad or your iPhone, it's probably because of him. We were just in Europe for two months, and so trying to launch Altstore, and I had to bring my iMac with me, and I brought my iPad. I need a way to program not on my iMac. And so I had to literally buy a MacBook Air M2 two weeks before the M3 one came out because I was just like, there's no way I can get my work done. And that to me was a really frustrating, like my iPad is an M1 chip, my iMac is an M1 chip, and I needed to buy a third computer. I asked Riley about the challenges of porting the full versions of Mac applications to the iPad. If we can't have Mac OS, can we just bring full Mac versions of the apps to the iPads? It's harder to go from Mac OS to iPad OS just because of like the technology stack. Because everything on Mac is written in a certain framework app kit that doesn't exist at all on the iPad. So to bring it over to the iPad, you're basically looking at a complete rewrite of your entire UI, which is like the hardest part to develop, honestly, or in my opinion. The other side is it's easy to go from iPad to Mac now with Catalyst. Mac Catalyst is an option in Xcode for iOS projects that developers can enable to make Mac versions of their iPad or iPhone app. And so I think that's what Apple is trying to push going forward. If you're making a new app, develop it for iPad first, but yeah, I don't, people aren't really doing that. So we're stuck in a situation where yeah, the Mac apps are just completely different worlds of the other platforms. Now, what about the design of the iPad would need to change to even be able to run Mac OS? I don't think much. If it were to happen, I really see something like it would be a Mac OS app that you could just boot into and then you would just be quote unquote, running Mac OS in its own little container environment. And I think that's basically a policy decision at this point based on the technology is there. There's a virtualization framework on the Mac that's even supported by the M1 chips that could in theory do this simply. So it wouldn't be as complicated as like a whole oh, big, huge overhaul to make it. Exactly. That virtualization framework Riley mentioned is still there. Apple would just have to do something with it. I thought that maybe the hardware was the problem, 
but this iPad Pro specs are comparable, if not better than the M2 MacBook Air, which has an eight core processor next to this iPad's 10 core CPU. So if it's not an impossible hardware problem holding this whole dream back, what am I missing? Oh yeah, money. This is Apple making a choice. At a post WWDC event, John Gruber asked Greg Joswiak and Craig Federighi about the people who want macOS for their iPad because they can't do their professional work on them. And this was their response. They're very different products. They're different design points and the Mac is the Mac. And I don't know, I don't know why people have wanted for the, the time that these have existed to want to merge them together. That's not our, that's not our desire. It's a, Still a big fat no. I do not want them to become the same device. No. And we want to keep making iPad the best iPad it can be. We, we are not trying to create a, a Windows 8 PC or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> so their answer to why not is pretty much, we don't want to. This felt pretty vague. Keeping the iPad separate is most likely more profitable, and my initial hunch here was if Apple made a MacBook with a touch screen or an iPad that could fully replace a Mac, they wouldn't sell as many devices if people didn't need to buy both. But I wanted to ask somebody who might know. I sat down with our very own Nilay Patel, who knows a ton about Apple. He's analyzed Apple on Vergecast for years and can shed some light on Apple's business decisions. Apple has always been pretty fine with cannibalizing itself. Historically, its executives, including Steve Jobs, have said things like, if anyone is gonna cannibalize our business, it had better be us. So they're really good at cannibalizing their own businesses and moving their customers from one product line to another. They initially viewed the iPad as the future of computing. They said it really loudly. This is the future of computing and Macs will fade away. And there was a moment where it seemed like the Mac was fading away, but the Mac was resilient because I think people wanted to do more things with computers than iPads let them do. And so they just kept buying Macs. Famously, to write an iPhone app, you have to have a Mac. You cannot write an iPad app on an iPad, which is really interesting. So you need a Mac for all this stuff. And I think that's gonna stay very powerful. The idea that the iPad would cannibalize that that is sort of up to Apple to allow, but I don't think it is a negative. I think it could very easily be a positive because it might actually drive people to buy an iPad that currently are not thinking of buying an iPad. I wasn't expecting that answer. And he's got a point. Apple has released products that made their older products obsolete, and it was seen as a positive. The iPod Nano stole sales from the iPod mini. iPods were replaced with iPhones. Well. If it isn't that, what's the real reason? Apple has a lot of incentives to protect how applications work on the iPad and the iPhone. The Mac is an open platform. Like Anyone can write a Mac application. They can distribute it to you any way they like. They can distribute apps in the web browser. And Apple doesn't get any of that money. Uh, so they just sell you a Mac, you have a Mac forever, and maybe you never pay Apple another cent after you buy your Mac. The iPhone in particular is very different. Apple owns that application model completely, end to end. Everything that happens on the iPhone is in Apple's control. So Neil is talking about how the App Store is the main way to get applications on your iPad. Apple gets 15 to 30% of app purchases, in-app purchases of digital content, and subscriptions. On Mac, you can get applications directly from developers without Apple getting a cut of that money. That's the business that's growing for them. They make an increasing amount of money from people who already have iPhones or are spending more money on their phones, and decreasing amount of money from people buying new phones. And those numbers haven't crossed yet, but that is the mix. The iPad sits right in the middle of those things because it looks like a computer, it looks like a MacBook, but the application model is still the iPhone's model where everything is in Apple's control. This makes a ton of sense. Apple doesn't want to give up that sweet app store money. If iPad literally had Mac OS, you wouldn't need to buy all those light versions of apps. Also, Selling hardware is more of a one-time purchase. The app store and subscriptions are potentially forever money. Disrupting the money iPads make from that would be the bigger blow in the long term. Apple's answer to macOS for iPads has consistently been no. So we asked, why not? It's not that iPadOS is bad. It just simplified what you can do on a MacBook and maybe took that too far if it still wants to be considered for professional use. I don't think iPadOS should get thrown out. There are people who are really happy with it. But when I used it for any sort of complex task, it had me feeling like, man, I wish I was using a real computer, even though it is one. 
It's certainly shaped like one and all the attachments that make it worth using. So why can't we have Mac OS on the iPad? After talking with Riley, I didn't feel like it was hardware holding it back. After talking to Neelai, it felt like it was mainly the App Store. It doesn't feel like Apple is going to change its mind on this anytime soon. Instead, there might be little updates to the iPad software and hardware that push it a little closer to Mac OS. One day, your iPad might even feel like you're using a real laptop. And on that day, you can ask yourself, oh wait, why didn't I just buy a laptop? The whole reason we made this video was because we kept getting a lot of the same question. So if you have any burning questions keeping you up at night that are about tech, let us know in the comments and we'll do our best to answer.